I'll tell you what I what I, I I'm struggling with, and it's on the same the same topic of do I hate something just because it's not the way that I did it, or do I hate something because I didn't do it that way initially for good reason? And so let's let's air the grievance of uh, multifunction aiming lasers all the way back by the barrel nut on a rail. Everything in my being says that that is vile uh, for multiple reasons. So uh, you're going to get IR backsplash off of everything out in front of that multifunction aiming laser that is going to create a self-induced photonic barrier, which can be mitigated by lowering the weapon system, raising the head further above, getting it out of your 40 degree field of view, blah, 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 blah. But the other thing is that what, when we were taught switchology, we were taught to place our switches and have our weapons set up organically so that there was the minimum amount of movement required in order to activate your stuff. As we moved from traditional grip to dominant C clamp grip uh, for shooting efficiency, uh, you know, jail blade, uh, jail bait splits with our rifles. Um, I thought that these people that were moving their multifunction aiming lasers to the rear, initially the guys I was seeing that were doing it were dudes that primarily went out during the day. And so they weren't getting a lot of nighttime jihad on. They were doing daytime key leader engagements uh, and drive-by shootings in their MATVs. That's, that's just what their operational profile was. Nothing, nothing against them. So I, I was assuming that their gun was being set up for optimal daytime shooting. They wanted a skinnier grip. They get a, a more dominant grip on the rifle when they're gassing dudes during the day because that's what they were doing 90% of the time. And nighttime shooting was an afterthought. Uh, and if you put your switches up in front of your laser, you now have to activate the laser, which is emitting into the back of your hand and then move your hand so that the lasers and the illuminators can extend out off of the front of the gun. Again, daytime grip, nighttime grip, you're not getting the neural pathways from the day that are transferring over into the night. So everything I've said is negative, 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 negative. And I thought that it was just, uh, young flex, youthful exuberance, desire to reinvent the wheel, lack of fucking experience, actually killing people in the fucking dark. Like I was making excuses for all the reasons why people would want to do this. Cause nothing that I was seeing on the internet was passing any kind of actual common sense test. And then I started seeing dudes that I know kill people at night and they were mounting their lasers back there. And that's when I had to stop, look at the problem from a completely different angle and say, why? Here are all the reasons why not. Why would somebody want to do that? And unfortunately, I haven't gotten to sit down and have a coffee or a Diet Coke with anybody that I respect that, uh, that does that. But I've had to come up with a hypothesis that uh, rail flex is minimized the further back towards the barrel nut well, not that you get with the rail. And so these guys are experiencing some bendy boy uh, issues as all of the barrels are going free flex and they're getting longer and uh, they're seeing unacceptable levels of uh, zero shift under combat conditions and barricade fire. And by moving the laser back closer to the barrel nut, potentially they're seeing a, a decreased uh, deviation shift when they load that rail uh, against an object. And mm -hmm. it took me seeing dudes <clears throat> that I actually respect doing it for me to step back, get out of my comfort zone and try to analyze why, why are you guys doing this? Cause I know why I wouldn't do this. Why are you doing it? Uh, I don't know if that's the truth. It's a hypothesis. It has not been tested. Certainly not, uh, 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 eliminating confounding variables and applying controls and, and what have you. But it is the only thing in my soul and based on my vast experience base that would lead grown ass, mature adults that employ these weapon systems at night 
to set their gun up to where when they turn on their their thing that's going to shoot at somebody you want to talk about something that could jack up a split time including your laser from being able to identify the target to get your hand out of the way that seems to me like you're adding some you're adding some hundredths in there that were not needed in, in a world where we're trying to be as efficient as possible so what is the game and uh mark so, your, you know mark your calendars today is december 19th 2021 today is the day that the internet moves all their lasers back because of what chuck just said so I got so I got something on that. Uh, whether whether you you're here or not, you know, it's completely that subjective view, and that's cool. Uh, so, um, and, and and this is this is um, uh, this is significant only to the MCX platform. So far as I have uh, experienced in in my shooting career. Um, so hung out uh, with some dudes from from Bragg, some some dudes you may know. Um, unit guys and whatnot and with the LVAWs and, and such and uh, that 300 blackout system, like even though they've got the fancy rail and upper receiver that I can't get, there's, there's like the guy, the two guys that I know uh, were, like both told me that I like, man, this thing sucks for rail flex, like blah, blah, blah. My citizen version is like dog balls. Like it, it's a no go, man. Like you, you put a laser out on the end of MCX, uh, you're, you're going to, if you bump that thing on a tree, you have now lost zero to the point of like eight inches at 50 yards. Like it's terrible. Um, and I've gone through like me and uh, David Wilson have, have worked with this gun. Um, I, I'm, I've got another idea. I'm getting ready to apply for it. But the, so what of all this is, is that the, the end goal, I love that gun so much. I love, I love everything about that gun so much that I'm willing to deal with the rail flex of it. Uh, what I, my backup plan, my final, thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to stick a freaking uh bobro nine inch riser on that hoe and i'm going to put a, a exps3 on i'm a mount a laser in front of that exps3 on, on the receiver itself um because I, I don't know what else to do and i want to use that 300 blackout gun so badly that that's that's what i'm willing to do uh and i'm gonna i'm gonna tape switch that freaking uh pressure pad over to the 11 o'clock and and that's how i'm gonna roll um but that that's that's what i got and and the, it's interesting you say that the unit guys that I, I saw uh, sitting around a dude's island in, in their in, in, in his house one time, uh, they they both had their LVAWs with the ingals mounted uh, toward the rear of the barrel nut because because they had to man. There's no like you can't you can't do it. <laughs> um, but the MCX is like, in my opinion, based on the 300 blackout platforms I've messed with, is the superior 300 blackout platform. Um, like they mm -hmm. they figured it out. Um, and and if that's what you got to use, that's what you want to use, whatever, then then that's what you got to do as of right now because there ain't a solution yet. Uh, I've I've seen some, uh, well, I may have seen some pictures of some stuff that maybe there's a fix that's uh, you know on the horizon, but you know what that means, like five years from now maybe. Uh, but as of right now, like the the fix is you got to get that thing back. Uh, if you put it on the end of the rail, it, you might as well not have it. For people that don't quite understand what we're talking about, uh, I did a video with Dugan Ashley and Carl Casarda from InRange TV where we showed barrel flex or not uh, rail flex rail. with lasers yeah. with lasers. Yeah. And it's uh it, we shot a couple different guns at different at a further distance. And yeah, it's a thing. There's a, there's a partial that's missing to that big equation too, is sling use. And sling mount placement, you know, we've done this in courses. I know Chuck and myself have talked about it over, over the years too. And when applying use of the sling, even exaggerating that rail flex more and getting that cross. So, so there's all kinds of mitigating factors to it, right? I, I don't know. I mean, there's a couple of rails out right now that have got, I, I think, you know, a lot of potential on that use forward or back. But again, there's always these other factors, right? So now you move the laser back, but what happens when you go white light and trying to use this? Mm -hmm. right so there's all these little combinations again depending on the job the role everything that's going on hey you're under a pro mask well daytime you, you might want to run that viz if you're not running a tall boy you know 193 204 mount so now you've got this going on and now you've got to do the same little you know you're moving light positions hot buttons mod buttons tape switches sro 7s don't care what it is so you have to play this game with everything right to, right to try to find this and ultimately it, it, I don't think it exists, right? Like like one perfect solution based on the job, the role, what somebody's doing. If, if that was a case, we'd have four optics on a gun or four sighting systems, two lasers, three flashlights, right? Like the old LaRue double mount for light and laser, right? You'd have two of those on each gun on each side of the rail. 
I mean, there is no solution, I think, to that overall. It's like, you know, Mark was saying about the MCX, you know, uh, it, it's an interesting gun. I, I do some stuff with another group of dudes where there's an armory full of them that they will not pick them up again and ever use them for work. And they're looking for replacement right now. And they use them a lot, but they will not touch them right now. You know, they're looking at other alternatives again. So there's always some variable, again, based on who and what. And, and you know, the thing with like laser placement, light placement, all these things, man, it, 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 it's it's the ultimate dress up Lego toy at that point. Yeah. Now, I mean, I, I brought up the laser as an illustrative point, sure. but it was, it was definitely a segue into, uh, yeah. and, and to what team Filster was saying in that, uh, yeah. you know, I had to put ego aside and apply critical thinking. Like I know how stuff works. I know how stuff works based on experience. People don't invite train wrecks. They don't invite, stacking tolerance problems to their decision-making cycle. And that, I think a lot of us that have any experience in, in NVG know that proper seeing of what we want to shoot at is almost as hard as shooting it. If you don't know where the end of the mass is, how can you aim at center of mass? So, so a visual, the visual aspect of seeing things and a huge portion of that is light too much or too little, and you're screwed. Um, and so why would you add problems into your situation, uh, or make shooting at night more difficult if there wasn't an upside. And I just couldn't for the life of me understand why guys were, uh, were, were doing this, choosing to have a setup that had all these downsides when I couldn't see the upside. And if I just wanted to be long in the tooth, old grumpy fart, I would just uh, have dismissed it as millennial bullshit. And, and, and that's not, that's not what it was, uh, at, at all. And I, and, uh, but it definitely took me stepping far out of my comfort zone of what I knew to be right, to try to even figure out a solution, hypothesize what could drive a human being to have such a janky, uh, rifle setup. So, well, the, the thing that you did in, in, in that story that I want to highlight is that you saw some guys you knew who knew their shit. And so you had the opportunity to ex extend the benefit of the doubt about this practice. You're like, I know those guys and I know they're not full of shit. So therefore there must be a reason for this. Now, the, I think one of the struggles that we have, the struggle like that we, you know, Mark was talking about with the, um, uh, redundant offset unmagnified optic is that you see people, you know, they know what they're talking about. You know, they haven't bullshitted you yet. You know, they haven't steered you wrong. You're aware that they think about certain things. And then the internet goes, none of that is relevant to what I'm perceiving. This new thing must be bullshit. And I'm somehow not capable of extending the person that I have this like fairly familiar online relationship with by consuming their content, any kind of benefit of the doubt about this new thing. And it's like, what have I been sh sharing information for 10 years for if on year 11, I don't get the benefit of the doubt about any of it? I think it relates back to the, the kind of like death of expertise and the uh, difficulty people have determining what genuine expertise looks like. And knowing the the things that have gone on in the Filster Concealment Workshop, the bar for expertise changes. Chuck may have been stacking bodies in 2004 under his IR night vision setup. That doesn't mean that today it's the best thing. Having watched the development of the Enigma now for the last year and a half, it changes the bar. I'm sorry, Combat Handgunner circa 1994 is not the quintessential guide to fucking concealment in 2021. The bar changes. Just because we hit it once doesn't mean that we're going to continue to hit it. I think a lot of that, too, is, is based on as the, like the primary, like, like Chuck was saying, and some of those, like, based on what the primary either rail 
gun has changed in the past 15 to 20 years, right? Like, so, you, you know, going from, you know, a, a Daniel Defense Riz or a KAC to a Geisley to, you know, just progressively down, up and down the line again to find either a lighter, skinnier rail or to shave weight here, or, you know, going from an HK 416 rail to the Geisley 416 rail, right? Or whoever else is, right? Always trying to improve on something else again changes something else to that effect. Yeah, I mean, one of the issues is that we have a uh, like like a like a whole integrated system of simultaneously competing best practices, right? So there's uh, best practice in theory for just about any single component that goes into any of this and everyone at every level is always trying to find some edge someone's looking for a lighter material or a, a thinner material something that's more durable something that has some uh some benefit that they're focused on and once that stacks on all the other competing um best practices then you wind up having to you wind up in a place where all of the best practices have added up just like a stacked tolerance to a point where you need to develop a, a new practice related to all of it, or they all arrive at a place where none of the things that they were all working on separately are relevant anymore. That's just, that's just, that's just a, a long-term engineering problem, you know, and we see it across every single technology you know it's like everyone wakes up one day and goes oh they made my phone slow on purpose it's like no they just they just changed absolutely everything around this piece of static technology in your hands <laughs>